Good afternoon. This is Professor Amina LD for Critical Talk. And this evening I have the honor. I mean, it is really an honor because even though I know him, I can't catch him half the time. Uh, talking with Dr. Rami Nashashibi. Uh, Dr. Nashashibi is the executive director of the Inner City Muslim Action Network, fondly known of as Iman. He is a MacArthur Genius Fellow and a 2018 Opus Prize Laureate. He received his PhD in sociology from the University of Chicago and has taught courses at multiple universities since, including a teaching appointment at the Chicago Theological Seminary. And as a matter of fact, he's running from a class that he's teaching now on organizing, community organizing. Ram is listed among the 500 most influential Muslims in the world by the World Islamic Strategic Studies Center in concert with Georgetown Prince Al Walid Ben Talal Center for Muslim Christian Understanding. He's appointed by President Barack Obama to the President's Advisory Council on Faith Based and Neighborhood Partnerships. He has served, he still serves, as a matter of fact, on the board of the Margaret Casey Foundation and is also an advisor to a number of strategic initiatives across the country. His work with the man continues to feature in many national and international media outlets. And I am proud to say he's a buddy of mine. So as we move to tackle things, I want to say first that we're in extraordinary times. And those of us who work with the man, we've uh, lost and gained and lost and gained and been through emotional, mental, intellectual, and physical upheavals. Yeah. But I also want to say that those of us around Chicago and around Atlanta who know Iman also know the dedication of an extraordinary staff of workers and an administrative body. Uh, I think it's important that we begin with what, for me as an educator, is one of the most outstanding developed strategies and comprehensive uh, understandings of the need of a disenfranchised, underprivileged, all those mm, dis and un words of uh, community. So I would like you to just take a few moments, take your time. I got a whole 50 minutes and talk about the philosophy that drives the man. Mm -hmm. Well, first of all, let me start off by saying to you, Dr. Aldean, you know, assalamu alaikum, and, and it is, I know you, you know, it's hard to pin me down, but as I was yeah. joking with you, if there's anyone in the Chicagoland area or in the country that has literally over a quarter of a century uh, with practice, it's you, and you, um, you will always be and have always been a light in my life, a person who uh, took me under her wing Oh, literally a quarter of a century ago. I, in many ways, I don't know if I'd be Would doing Would you stop with the quarter century stuff? It's quarter of a century. Like, I'm getting five years ago. Quarter uh, of a century. <laughs> <laughs> Makes you sound important. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank All you. All right. Um, but I will say this, that look, um, the philosophy, as you know, uh, better than most, is driven by this idea of what holistic health, wellness, and healing in the inner city looks like. Um, it's a vision undergirded by the idea that the American Muslim tradition has been in, animated, inspired by uh, individuals from day one who saw the life-giving force of our tradition uh, as a healing force. Uh, and it that the idea that um, Muslims, whether they were coming from the experience that came out of the Black American Muslim tradition, that came out of an experience of seeking liberation from the uh, oppressive structures of white supremacy, or whether it was refugees who were coming here and thinking about how to better uh, articulate a, a message of their tradition that connects them with communities, 
in ways that, uh, again, provide a way of hope in places and challenges uh, in dark times. I think our Iman really sits on the shoulders of those communities in very literal and figurative ways. And so really ever since the incorporation in 97 and in the years before that, in the lead up of Iman, we were always inspired by that. I've always been inspired by mm -hmm. And, you know, inspired by the way it looks, you know, in places that are often overlooked and um, often underappreciated, um, even in places where there's stigma associated with it. I mean, I did my dissertation in part, uh, you know, I spent a lot of time with the Black Peace Stone Nation, those who came out of the, the street organizations. At, that, at one point, that was the largest, oldest Black street gang in America. But at one point, they, you know, Muslim tradition was incorporated in different ways and authentically as a way out of the most destructive aspects of, right. uh, of what That's was happening on the street. And Iman has always been around that work. And we've always sought through our organizing to bring um, our communities together, uh, you know, that whether that those communities were, again, coming out of immigrant experiences, Rep, children of refugees like my grandparents who came from Palestine in the early 50s to the south side of Chicago, or whether it was those who were fleeing the terror of the south uh, and landing into Chicago um, through the Great Migration. Um, Iman has sought to bring these eclectic aspects of our experiences together to address life in urban areas. And we've done so um, with, you know, I think uh, a very intentional methodology of bringing um, the healing through our health center, through work with re-reentry, through work with arts and culture, through uh, housing, with re-entry, with food deserts. These are all a range of issues that we do through three fundamental departments at our organization. And, you know, I, I think our, our, especially in this moment, um, I think the model of Iman, the philosophy of, of Iman, of being a source of healing, aspiring to be a place uh, of healing that both calls out injustices, calls out implicit and explicit mm -hmm. racism mm -hmm. in the systems, but also calls up to something. You know, um, for us, it's never been enough just to simply call out without calling up. Yeah. Um, you know, and so I think that continues to guide our work in Chicago and Atlanta. I think it continues to be why. Iman is seen as kind of forging a relevant model for urban centers, you know, and quite frankly, in, in places across the country. Uh, it's yes. because we spent a lot of time, uh, as you noted, with mm -hmm. an extraordinary staff, many young yeah. people, many young people of color um, were very unapologetically led in many ways by young black and brown, you know, sisters and brothers who come out of these direct experiences. We see that leadership on our board. We see that leadership on our staff. And uh, I'm just proud that, you know, over the years, the model has emerged as something that people, I think, across the country really feel invested in. I think that that is uh, one of the things that many, especially during a pandemic, Ramadan, and then the protests. Yeah. One of the things that many um, other aspiring community, especially in the Muslim community, um, community organizations have struggled with. They didn't have a solid concept of what do you do? Mm -hmm. You know, where are the needs? Whereas Iman for 20 some odd years has known what the needs are experientially. Yeah. And yeah. then tried to design with some, some forethought how does one not just put a band-aid how right. does one grow stuff so i want to before we get into the actual programs how did folks sit down and think about doing more than band-aid work yeah that's important you know and that's a great question mm. because Iman is a nonprofit that does bring together areas of the nonprofit sector that at one point were very separated from one. Yes. Another. 
Yes. And that was the common logic 15 years ago. By that I meant 15 years ago in the nonprofit field, you either did direct social service. Mm -hmm. You were either a direct social service right. provider or health or and, and health sometimes got branched under direct social yeah. service or you were an arts organization or you were a social justice advocacy organization. You were very rarely all three. Yes. And, you know, we always can our we always contested that that logic of being one or the other just never flew with the reality of our communities on the ground. In other words, how am I going to provide? Yes, I want to change criminal justice law that's directly affecting the 18,000 people that are coming home every year, often under very unfair circumstances. And I want to get those people involved in organizing in helping to change that law. But how do I do that as a community organization building a base and not addressing the people's needs at the same time? They need housing. They need jobs. How are we going to take them down to Springfield and organizing? And they say, I don't even got a place to sleep at night. Right? <laughs> you want me to organizing for social justice change? I, I don't even got a job next week. Right? right? You want me to think about um, these larger policy issues? So Iman very organically. And I'd like to say that, you know, you remember this, Dr. Aldine, when, when I was in school as an undergrad, nonprofit degrees, you know, they were just beginning to emerge. I know, I, did, I, know, I, I, did, yeah. I did not graduate with any expertise in nonprofit management. And I want to say, thank God I didn't. Because if I think if I did, I would have led a much more calculated uh, and <laughs> almost clinical way yes. of building yes. a nonprofit. And that's not how we went about it. We were really driven by the impulse of the community, by the realities on the ground. We are driven by spirit that we were, you know, of organizing, of movement building. Many of us, myself, was very inspired by the legacy of the Black Panthers, by the, le I mean, and we talk about that legacy now, but that legacy was, was very real, as you remember in Chicago. They were the first ones that modeled community clinic programs. Right. They were the first ones that were modeling programs about breakfast programs right. there were you know and they were also talking about very radical transformation right. and social justice racial justice so the fact that a lot of us were animated by that and going into the community then developing our community uh strategic kind of nonprofit model was i think important because it helped us land on a comprehensive uh -huh. holistic approach that now quite frankly I know because I, I'm privileged to sit in these spaces. I sit on nonprofit boards. I'm in conversations with CEOs and program officers across the country. The now Iman's model is not only seen as, uh, as a exemplary model, but it's seen as best practices that nonprofit yes, yes. foundations are saying we're, we're looking at. Just this last week, MacArthur released an RFP, a request for proposal that was all about the integrative role of arts with social change exactly, and organizing. Exactly. And, and Iman has been doing that work forever. And mm -hmm. they, you know, we were able to submit, and in many ways, they were open in saying it was organizations like Iman that helped shape that RFP because we have been out there demonstrating that arts integrated with social justice, integrated with community health, integrated with housing work just made sense to us. And we were able to demonstrate we can do that and still be focused on real outcomes because that was also say, the law. Yeah. But you're also perhaps unintentionally, but obviously mm -hmm. interfaith, Absolutely. intergenerational, because mm -hmm. you got my old, my young soul mm -hmm. and uh, multi-ethnic. Mm -hmm. Pay attention to gender. Mm -hmm. We have many young women mm -hmm. who are being uh, nurtured into leadership roles, mm -hmm. coming from sometimes nowhere, sometimes coming from, you know, just a, a, a bachelor's degree in something or the other. We have young men who are being nurtured, groomed, and, and taught the arts of debate and public speaking and all of the things that they will need uh, to go forward in life. So it's, it's 
all of those programs, but it's the personal mentoring that must happen. Mm -hmm. That is that core that makes that exceptional staff. Yeah, no, that's a great point. And, and that's been, you know, it's interesting because time and time again, um, I'll remember one foundation site visit. Um, they brought the program officer and the program officer came in and I'll be honest, you know, occasionally I get these calls to say, Hey, Rami, the so-and-so foundation's interested in your food, uh, security work, your food doesn't work. Uh, they want to have a site visit with you. And so this was one of those phone calls and I looked at what they were funding and this is, you know, don't judge the book by its cover. Um, and I and I looked at what they're funding, and they're fun. This was maybe ten year, nine years ago, eight years ago. They were funding a bunch of neocon stuff. I'm like, what on earth? <laughs> <laughs> like these guys, what are they going to want to do with us? I mean, this mm -hmm. is like, and what mm -hmm. do we want to do with them? I mean, exactly. Like, but so the the woman came, and she came with the patriarch son, who was an older white man, maybe in his seventies, late seventies and he just wanted to observe the site visit the woman had said listen i've been able to convince this middle of the road slightly conservative foundation that food justice issues matter and we've looked at your work and it's some cutting edge work so we'd like to hear about it so i had my uh, i think i was in the visit i had my current deputy director alia bilal who you know young African-American woman started many now over 15 years ago. I had my other deputy director, a young black man from Southside Shamar, and I believe someone else in the site visit. And um, all of us were talking. And at one point, the patriarch's son, i.e. The, the interrupted, mm -hmm. said, I want to say something. And I could tell the program officer started rolling her eyes like, oh, my God, this guy's totally derailing the site visit. He said, all of your work about food deserts and stuff like that it's all amazing but i want to be honest that's the least interesting thing going on here <laughs> tell, she said tell us about you like and, and what he meant was i'm amazed by you all like yeah, this is yeah. an extraordinary group of people that are able to bring experiences together people together faith communities the interfaith work you do is not like photo op interfaith work. Oh, look, we're reading from the Bible. They're reading from the Quran. They got from the Torah. No, it's, about, it. it's about it's about um, it. how how our faith communities come together to impact real change on the ground. I think our staff learned how to develop authentic ways with which we relate to people very genuinely. Right. right. Uh, that and is still they know that you're Muslim and they, that's, and, that's key. And, and unapologetically know that we're rooted in Muslim values and that, like you mentioned, though, some of our staff aren't, but you know, we'll come in and most of our staff, whether they're Muslim or not, will extend you an you do some <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And, um, you know, when, when it's time to finish a meeting, it may be a sister from the black church who closes us uh, off in prayer. It may be someone, from the Hebrew tradition that closes off, we close off in prayer. We're unapologetic about one of our principles of change. Our first principle of change is, is the idea of being deeply rooted and broadly informed, right? Yeah. That we are spiritually deeply rooted in our traditions, but we're also unapologetically broadly informed by many experiences. Yeah, exactly. And by the way, for Muslims across the globe, we don't think there's anything contradictory with Islam about that. that you know, when we think about the prophet, peace be upon him, his tradition was to draw from what was great and good and uh, right. from everywhere. And that, that that was the right of the believer, that if you believe it all came from the same source anyway. If you believe all goodness and all wisdom. You know, the verse that we have on the side of the wall at Iman, I think in many ways encompasses so much of that spiritual tradition, which says it's from Surah Rahman. And the verse is very simple, but it, you know, in three or four words, says everything. Hal jazal ahsan illa ahsan. Is there any reward for good and spiritual excellence other than good and spiritual excellence? Exactly. Right? So when you're aspiring to be a good force in the world, 
when you're aspiring to be a source of mercy, when you're aspiring for justice, you're treating people with dignity, irrespective of where they're coming from. You see good in people. You understand that the circumstances that our communities have lived in have in many ways diminished our humanity and that our communities need an opportunity to celebrate our humanity, to recover that humanity, to demonstrate what that looks like. And when you're unapologetic about that and that you understand that first and foremost in America, we can say unapologetically without diminishing any other experience that first and foremost, Allah has allowed that example to shine the brightest for us first and foremost in the black American experience. And that doesn't, that doesn't demean any other experiences. It simply says that that experience is, is rooted first and foremost in traditions that touch all of our communities in one way or the other. And what, you know, Iman, I think, although we are certainly multicultural and we are very diverse, um, we are also, I think, unapologetic about centering um, our commitment to the black community broad. And that does in not any way, shape or form, again, diminish our experiences, our connections elsewhere, and that we see yeah. it collectively. But, um, you know, we we certainly know that above and beyond where, you know, you come to our health center at any given moment, you're going to see four or five languages, people from every walk of life. You're going to certainly see that in our programming. You're certainly going to see that in our staff and and it's not an either or and our our organization still um is again unapologetically rooted in a muslim experience and unapologetically rooted in a muslim spiritual experience that really does come out of the black american tradition and we just have to be honest about that and and, and well that's, that's why i think people are scrambling now but i want you to pivot a little bit sure and i want to start with green reentry yeah first why is it named green reentry mm -hmm. and not purple or blue <laughs> or yellow and what is it all about because it is an essential program yeah it really is and it's emerged as you know one of the four critical departments for our work um green reentry arts and culture health center and organizing are kind of the four driving departments all of them interconnected but also distinct um, green reentry is green because first, um, you know, the idea of green reentry was emerged in part. We've always worked uh, with not only been working with, but led by people who've come uh, returning citizens from day one, have been part of our board, been part of our base, been part of a constituency. It's impossible to disentangle the American Muslim experience from incarceration in America because our communities have been surveilled, they've been incarcerated, they've been criminalized. And part of the American Muslim community is rooted in that experience. I mean, yes. you know, and we, we, we shouldn't run away from it and deny it. It's the Malcolm story, but right. quite frankly, it's, it's all of those stories of people right. who have found themselves facing five, 10, 15, 20, 30 years in many ways because of all of the circumstances that are part of the racialized narrative that so many people now are at least talking about in different ways. And we hope we're beginning to see a paradigm shift. But so number one, we've always had that community as part of our work. But for the first 10 years of Iman, you know, first 10 or 15 years, um, 11 years or so, we were trying to find what was the best way to really serve this community. We were definitely going down to uh, state legislature and changing laws with brothers who were incarcerated. Uh, and, but when it came to jobs and housing, we really didn't have much, you know, we had very little. And in 2009, um, right around there, 2009, 2010, um, we came up with, um, it was at the same time that, you know, around 2009, the, the uh, Obama administration put a lot of stimulus dollars into the Department of Environment and RFP came out and it was shortly after the, you know, the consequences of of foreclosure was ravaging right, the right. like most inner people have forgot the pandemic wiped away people's memory. They yeah. don't even remember we had a recession. Right. We had a, we had, <laughs> right. In 2008, 2009, and that recession devastated urban communities even more because you know you had almost 50 percent foreclosures on certain blocks and so 
you had vacancies and um and of course that created more crime more you know issues that were associated with quality of life iman though saw in that moment at least an opportunity to say what if we came up with an initiative that took these properties on concentrated blocks and took the skill set of rehabilitating them uh the trades carpentry hvac electric and came up with a program to uh, green retrofit these buildings while giving our guys the skill sets to succeed. And so green reentry first came out with the green being kind of an ecological uh, rehabilitation. But it also mm -hmm. for us, green was a spiritual color too. It kind of is mm -hmm. a, a middle way. Uh, mm -hmm. And it has symbolisms in the color spectrum if you look from high red to the high red. <laughs> green right is right there in the middle and we wanted to you know we knew that re-entry was also a successful re-entry was predicated on a real deep you know quality of life spiritual centering uh you know a way of kind of bringing people into a consciousness that allowed them to be able to mentally spiritually be able to deal with all of the baggage that any person coming home had to deal with to be able to succeed. And then lastly, green was the color of the Benjamins, right? And we knew we wanted to create pathways for the do for self economic independence. So green reentry kind of emerged as this more holistic reentry program. We started in our early years with cohorts of five, seven, and now grown to cohorts of, you know, 30, 40. Uh, and we are now- What's that? And the waiting, waiting list, list. <laughs> unfortunately, you know, I, I'm not proud of that waiting list because <laughs> it's a it's a painful reality. Yeah. You no, know, for me, uh, especially when when we see people that are on our waiting list getting shot, some dying. You know, I, I told the mayor herself this last week and weekend. They convened us after a couple of these shootings. And one of the biggest frustrations for me, and I articulated that to the mayor, is that, you know, in many cases, we know who's shooting. We yeah. know who's getting caught up in the cycle of violence. Right. And, it's a, and it's a myth that they don't want to do better. They right. want better. Many of them do. They want opportunities. My, our waiting list is a uh, exhibit A. They've been yeah. waiting for opportunities. They're desperately, I literally went to that meeting after meeting with three young men in the in the dearborn homes on stateway the stateway project literally and i pulled them out of their house because i knew that weekend you know uh, someone got killed and shot on 65th and green and i know that they were connected and i and i begged them and he said rami one of these guys said listen i went through the program i lost my job from covid 19 get me back in i promise i will stay away from the trunk the drama but i you know um, but it's hard. So Where are you going? It's, it, it's hard, it, and it's um, hard. And it, so, green reentry is now emerged as a wraparound program with uh, mental health, behavioral health services. Uh, we've modeled a even extension of green reentry called Green Re Weekend Warriors that um, last year modeled uh, a cohort that brought them not only five days a week but also through the weekends at the colleges. Uh, I'm proud to say that now. The chancellor of the city colleges has met with the mayor. They want to take that to scale so that they can now, you know, expand it to multiple city colleges, get the gentlemen that are in our program college credits, get right. them enrolled in the college trajectory. So it's growing and, you know, it's now also one of the, the, the most dynamic parts of uh, Eman Atlanta is also its green reentry program. So that's green reentry. Well, now I will go to one of my favorite places, which is the health center. Yes, you know, your and favorite and mine. You know, I know this is, is tiring and wearing, but I think it's very important to understand the importance of health. I want to tie health straight back into green reentry, especially our mental health uh, department and the need for addiction counseling. And then the everyday need for, you know, of folks in the community. Yeah. And, you know, look, I, I use my health. I use our health center. I got COVID. I got my fourth COVID-19 test yesterday. I oh, shit. I'm only on two. 
you know, and, and our health center staff is so great with me. I don't even schedule my appointment. They schedule it for me because they know, Rami, as much as you are running around, jumping exactly, around, exactly. we need to test your butt yeah. as often as possible. So, yeah. but, um, so, but, you know, whether it's the testing, whether it's the comprehensive holistic health and behavior health, again, not the best statistic, but one that demonstrates need that we have a seven month waiting list to get a behavioral health appointment at Iman. Um, that's how extraordinary the need of post-traumatic. Someone, uh, I was with Dr. Carol Adams the other day, and she said, there's not too much P in our PTSD. In no. other words, the post-traumatic stress disorder, it it's not in post. It's People <laughs> are dealing with it right now. Mm -hmm. And I mean, you name it from being pent up in single, you know, can you imagine the number of people who have died to shelter in place in these 700 square foot apartments with, you know, poor living conditions, right. then you got so the violence people. outside, mm -hmm. losing work, losing employment, on top of everything else. So, you know, Iman's Health Center um, is now, as you know, a federally qualified health center. It was one of uh, it was the only uh, health center to win that designation last year in the state of Illinois. Um, we've had such extraordinary people along the way. Um, Dr. Altaf Kesar Dean, now Dr. Sophia Adoui, um, but just a really dynamic team of providers all the way around from our behavior health team. Um, just very, very dedicated clinicians, dedicated healthcare professionals interns they make up a really comprehensive team that deals with everything from family behavior health to primary care issues um and it's growing every day and, we have uh, mental. and our oral health program so we're you know really looking at the spectrum of what quality health care looks like and you know it says something to us that even and as you know we're still building out we still uh are our health center is still a pretty modest facility. It's not a huge building. Right, uh, right. Our, it's a couple of buildings now, and we're looking to expand it. But even in the modest physical infrastructure that we are, it always says something to me. Uh, uh, last year, you know, a, a brother, probably in his early 60s, mid 60s, but in good shape, was riding, a, you know, and I'm a, I love cycling. And I, uh, so I saw him cycle right up to the health center and I call it, came up to him. I said, I said, man, how long was your bike ride? My brother, cause you know, I'm always comparing, but he said, man, I, I just rode a good 35 miles. I said, really? I said, from where? He said, I, I came from Oak Park. I said, okay. Um, why are you here? He said, oh, I'm coming to my appointment to the health center. Yeah. I said, you rode your bike from Oak Park past probably no less than 15 FQHCs. Uh, many of them the one with, and they what, well, many of them looking a whole lot better than ours in terms of physical. <laughs> and uh, and I said, he didn't know I was the executive director. He didn't know who I was uh -huh. talking to. But it said something to me that we've had it's those a, type of patients it's that, care. that it's the quality of care. It's the fact that we try to make everyone feel like their family. That when right. you're sitting in our waiting room, that you feel like you're sitting in your living room, not in a clinical space where you don't matter. Um, and uh, just this morning, I read a beautiful letter written to our behavior health staff that said, when I first came to there, I was rough. Uh, this is a woman who said, and I know I intimidated people. And I know people were intimidated by me. And I could just read her tone in the email. She said, when I first sat with your behavioral health team, she said, and they said, but they broke me down and I broke them down. And after mm -hmm. 10 weeks, we were family. And I received more support here than I would have received That's anywhere true. else. And uh, she said, you know, everything good must come to end because she was done with her first uh, counseling. And she was just writing a thank you email about what, awesome? what type of quality care how her life has been changed by the quality of healthcare providers that we have. Well, I think I, I can segue off doing that. So let me see where I want to go. Mm. 
I remember when we first started the uh, community cafes and some of us who just love music, you know, said, okay, well, let's get down here and protect these youngins from the naysayers, you know, and I'm patting my foot and I'm listening to this stuff and I'm saying, whoa, right over my head. Okay, but I, I will get this, this talk and the music, you know, because I'm remembering all the old rappers, you know, and Sugar Hill Gang and this and that. And you know I'm saying I can do this. I can, I can still do this. And I was floored by, you know, safe space has become a euthanism, one sense of a trope in another space. But comfort space. Mm -hmm. You right. know, pouring out my spiritual heart. Yeah. And then the cyber stuff. I sat back, you all don't think I listened, but I and I listened to some of the cybers and I said, Oh my God, this yeah. is so creative. I'll be damned. You know, it's like, right. whoa, new genre here. So while the community cafe may not be considered a program, it adds to the sense of family. Right. So can you say a few words? Well, about and, and, and as you were saying, Dr. Alvin, you know, <laughs> Community Cafe was only one part of the larger arts and culture mm -hmm. part. Mm -hmm. And arts and arts expression at Iman have always been part of the lifeblood of who we were and who and what brought us together. Literally today, literally, probably around five hours ago, I was on the phone because I was driving past mm -hmm. 53rd and Halstead. And I looked and I saw a mural and someone contacted me and it was a brother by the name of La V Raven. Now, did I just lose folks or? If I'm still in here, I'm gonna continue to talk because I think I may have lost Dr. Aldine. But um, okay, I'm gonna continue to talk. Um, the you know I came and for me when I uh, when I think about our arts and culture work and and I the, the individual Lobby Raven is a is a person that goes back almost 25 years with us. He's a hip hop artist. He's a uh, graffiti muralist, and I'll remember. Um, back in early 1995, almost a couple of years before we incorporated Iman, we were already doing this work and many of us were uh, steeped in hip hop culture. And some people just simply didn't understand hip hop. Hip hop in its early years, especially in those 90s, was probably the active force that was bringing, uh, you know, black, brown, Latino, Arab kids together, expressing themselves in ways that were authentically uh, who they were. Of course, you know, hip hop, uh, like all great cultural uh, production in America, once again, really first and foremost comes out of the black American experience, yet it allowed for what was brilliant about hip hop, it allowed everyone to be themselves, yes. right? Hip hop was the uh, ultimate radical democracy in action in art space, because it created the idea of the cipher which is anyone can step in the cipher and you can, and you, and in fact, the more authentic you are in the cipher about who you are. So if you can spit a little bit in Arabic, and yeah. you're, gonna, you're gonna get the brothers that sit back and say, whoa, no. oh. <laughs> <laughs> like you gotta teach me a little bit of that, right? So, you know, whatever, whatever you did and, and Iman drew off that energy of the cipher we drew off the energy, the power of art to bring yep. people together and to imagine what we talk about the arts is the arts has always been able to connect the disconnected. Uh, the art art was a vehicle to radically reimagine what is possible, right? And so Iman's arts work over the years from those early community cafes to what we've done over the internet cyphers during the during the, the kind of COVID moment to big arts events like taking it to the streets, to building an MLK memorial, to our ceramic studio has always been really about connecting disconnected communities, has always been about radically reimagining space. Um, and, you know, arts continues to be very important in all aspects of our work. And but it is, 
it is so foundational, but it's also um, giving back. No, it's not giving back. It's mimicking all of the programs when you take them together, mimic what a healthy community should mm. look like. Yeah. It's care for those who have been unjustly, you know, taken away and a way for them to come back to retrieve skills that we worry about. Not, ooh, I'm not supposed to say that. You worry about. <laughs> oh, sorry about that. There was a slip. Um, you worry about the their health and well-being because they have access to the health care center. But we also give them the space of play. Mm -hmm. you, you know what I'm saying? Absolutely. But they, those creative juices to yep. get in there and oil you up. Yep. And then we move to, and it's one of the things, and I eat there every time I'm in the neighborhood, which is not often enough, the kitchen. Yeah, the farmer's market, all our all our health and the, work. And the farmer's market yeah. and the 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 emphasis on with what you have, nutrition. Yeah. Well, and all of that work of all that emphasis uh, historically has fallen under our organizing and advocacy department. And so our organizers have not only organized and passed criminal justice reform, we've not only worked in coalition and alliances, but we've probably developed one of the strongest models for food, deserts and justice intervention in the country. We started a corner store initiative that is about really radically reimagining the modern day corner store. After the killing of George Floyd, we were you know, invited to Minneapolis to work with people like right. Malcolm and Arab store owners and trying to think about meaningful interventions because our work has been, you know, leading well, the way. You know, it needs to be patented mm -hmm. so that in some way, form or another, as a model coming out of Iman, yeah. where when you can't physically get there, there is some way, you know, we're doing everything by Zoom, some way for folks to say, hey, we need an intervention. Well, you know, uh, uh, I'll bring that up at another time. Right. Uh, you know that that people can connect immediately because it is so forceful and yep. so hard thought yeah yeah and and i think that model that you're talking about is you know as you as you know we've talked about we feel responsible for we yeah. because iman is an organization that people support from across the country um mm -hmm. Our Ramadan drives every year, our you know million dollar Ramadan drives, we depend on that those dollars to do all the type of work that we do to make those hires. And we're able to meet and exceed those goals because people in Wichita believe in that. Because yeah. people in the Bay believe that this model is relevant. And so when I get a call to go do a workshop, our, our organizers and Minneapolis or we're in Buffalo this last entire week I was in Buffalo I just came back because why one of our artists uh, Drea Denor who uh, I'm also doing a project with and, and and recording and doing a lot of recording with but she's also an example on Juneteenth we had Drea in mm -hmm. Buffalo and we had Jacory Arthur who was in in Louisville and yeah. and um, we are talking about the, the both of these artists are longstanding members of Iman's artist community. They are on, on our artist roster. They work with us and they both exemplify the way art and social justice and organizing are connecting. I mean, in Louisville, Jacory was leading the push for Brianna's law around Brianna's Taylor. He just got elected the youngest councilman in Yay! Louisville. And Louisville does not know what they're in for because this because this brother is a brilliant artistic mind and he has publicly credited Iman and Iman's artist retreat as planting the seed for community organizing that led him to run this race. And if you look at it, he, he won by 248 votes. He, every time he spoke, we got Muhammad Ali's <laughs> oldest daughter, a close friend of mine who went to Hajj with me, went to Jerusalem. 
endorsed him, Maryam Ali, yeah, yeah. and was the only Ali, uh, only member of Muhammad Ali's family to endorse anybody in that race. Um, and then in Buffalo, uh, Drea Denour, an artist, has been leading the drive to get uh, a woman by the name of Cariel Horn, who was is a black police officer, who in 2006 was uh, got a another fellow police officer who was choking a man like this like george floyd and we everyone was asking you know why didn't anyone intervene well cariel intervened she pushed a white police officer off a black man saved the black man's life in return was hit so hard right when, yeah was hit so hard that she had to have reconstructive surgery was 40 days away from her retirement lost her pension and for the last 15 years, lost her home, harassed by the police. And now when when the black uh, mayor and police commissioner was expressing outrage after George Floyd, Drea called them out. Drea Denour, our artist, called them out around four weeks ago, said, you all are a bunch of hypocrites. Can we have Carrie O'Horn, who you all sat by and watched her suffer, right. and then turned to Iman for legal support. We secured the best legal counsel for Drea uh, and Cariel, and I will spent the last week there. Friday, an announcement's going to be made about this this case, and we are extraordinarily excited about the movement there. Yeah. But I just I just raised that to say here's the example of arts and artists as organizers, right. artists that are making things happen. Um, that this model is relevant not only in Chicago and Atlanta. But in Louisville, in Buffalo, in, in, in the Bay, in and, um, and people are looking for it and looking for this type of work because Iman, we're humble and modest in the sense that we know our model is only rooted in those who came before us. Exactly. We're just bringing the threads together. Right. You know, we've always been clear with Iman Muhammad. Iman, not, nothing we do, nothing we're doing is really new. Right. I mean, it's, it's just putting, an extension. It's an, it's, extension, a darn good extension. Right. it's an extension of everything that's come before us. But it's the creative innovation that, you know, uh, minds before us have pushed us to do. And, and we're just very, you know, deliberate about trying to connect those those dots. Well, let me I want two last things. One mm -hmm. is the Go Green on Racine project. Yes. And the second one is thoughts about goals i mean I would, it, it's hard to think of stuff for the future when we're treading water now yeah but if you could use our last few moments to talk about those two things i'd appreciate well it. that's a great that's a great way to end on i'll be honest because go green on racine in my mind represents over 20 years of work it is in a collaboration with our inglewood partners rage residents of association greater inglewood team working inglewood it's taking an intersection on uh, Inglewood, right there in the heart of Inglewood, 63rd and Racine, and proposing a radical transformation uh, from the ground up uh, that will eventually lead to the opening of a Green Line station that's been closed, unjustly really closed. Like so mm -hmm. much of everything, it's been abandoned, it's been neglected. Yeah. Uh, and the moment, you know, there could be no more project that's more relevant to the moment uh, that we're living in, not only in Chicago, but across the country, and in many ways across the globe, because the way we're envisioning this is all led by and for the people, by those who are most directly affected. This is not being choreographed on the 17th yeah. floor of a high rise from downtown right. Chicago. Right. This is being driven on the ground by the people on the ground closest to the pain but it's done so with deliberation with partners from the University of Chicago, from Kirkland, best legal counsel, best community counsel. We've solicited some of the best advice uh, and have come up with a, an extraordinary vision. And we're, and we're moving forward on that vision. We know that in the end of this month, the announcement will be made uh, that God willing, you know, we're, we're praying that we uh, we're in contention for but irrespective of what happens with that announcement, we're moving forward with this vision of Go Green on Racine. We're moving forward with the project. Um, we've already broken ground on one very important aspect of it, which is a model corner store. It's called the Fresh Market. 
It's going to have cooperative community ship ownership values. It's going to be uh, a beautiful place to shop, a beautiful place to call home in Inglewood. It's going to be people that you know are uh, great artwork in the space, fresh produce, and uh, uh, you know a model that really lifts up and celebrates the community. Um, and you know, I, I'm, Go Green on Racine has its own website. Encourage people to go look at it. Encourage people across the city to become members or friends of the market. People ask us what you can do. That's one very practical thing. That can you, you say can. that? Can you repeat where what the website address um, is? Go Green on Racine dot com. It's just all one word, um, and you can get information at emancentral.org dot org as well. Um, and you know, last and then also, um, folk who are listening to the program, look at Eman's website. Mm -hmm. Just go and you know peruse. You know, like you're going to do the shopping that you can't do now because we'll get shut down again. So just get on the website, hold yeah. down those things, and go peeking in things. Now, lastly, goals. Well, go, you know, and you know this, we have such an extraordinary staff and board. Um, Omar Carter, our great board chair, Clyde Alamin, our co-chair, you and uh, Abid, and um, just a diverse, young and intergenerational board with an extraordinary staff. We have a, a strategic plan called Approaching 2022, which will be our fifth, which will be our 25th anniversary marker for the organization. I think what you're gonna see men try to continue to do is build a sustainable, thriving, uh, holistic model here in Chicago and in Atlanta. We are going to continue to reach out to partners across the country. Um, you're gonna see us try to model uh, both going deep and wide and demonstrating that we can do that in ways that are both sustainable far-reaching and transformative. Um, and so lots of really exciting things on the horizon. Um, but most importantly, we want to be an institution that the larger American Muslim community, and quite frankly, all communities can look to with a source of pride, hope yeah. that there is an entity like Iman that believes in the goodness of our community, that believes in the fundamental, you know, that even at a time with a lot of negativity, a lot of despair, um, man, really, we continue to see light in one another's faces. We continue yeah. to see divine light, even where, um, you know, even in the dark, grimy and spaces, we continue to see hope. We continue to see the transformative possibilities of what can happen when our communities spiritually come together. And I, and I pray and hope that for many years and decades to come, we can be exemplars of that work. Well, this is Professor Kamenal Dean. It has been my honor to have snatched some of the very busy time from Dr. Rami Nashashibi. And I think we have a clearer picture mm -hmm. of the intricacies of Iman. A lot of people have heard the name but they haven't perhaps had the opportunity to go by there. I would encourage you to look at the website, look at the Go Green on Racine website, and just go. I mean, if you can, you know, wear your mask, put on your glove, get out your furry coat, whatever it is you need, and just get on down there and just take a peek. If you don't do anything but drive on your daily, let me get out the house thing. I want to thank you, Dr. Nashashibi for spending this time with me this evening. Thank you and much love to you and the family and Imam Frederick and to all of those watching. Thank you. Assalamu alaikum.